a number, if I have, so if for all intervals x, y, and g, we have the rising polynomial is equal to the falling polynomial, then the a, b index of g, which I never defined, okay, so of course, so, uh, so I should say the a, b index of g, well, let me, I'm actually assuming I have a bottom and a top element, so I'm going to leave this loose like this. Then the a, b index of g, um, it's experimental, so I can mm -hmm. count something, um, can be written as a polynomial with integer coefficients. This is actually important, this integer. I'll say why I know that. Um, with integer coefficients in uh, the variables, non commuter variables, C and D. So let's first say something about this condition. R tilde is equal to F tilde on every interval. What does that mean? Let's look at, for example, a rising path of length K. That makes a contribution to the term Q to the K minus 1. So that, this is telling you that the coefficient there is equal to the q to the k minus 1 here. In other words, all the paths of length k that are rising, it's the same number of paths that are falling of length k, and that's true for every k. And this is actually a generalization of the R labeling condition. So remember for R labeling, I told you, have this nice labeling so that if you look in every interval, we have a unique rising chain. One thing that nobody ever talks about is there actually is also a unique falling chain with that R labeling condition. So, um, so this is an extension of that condition. Um, another thing about why I'm, I'm being spe uh, specific about integer coefficients, uh, I'm not going to have time to go through the proof, but in the proof, the first beginning of part of the proof, we actually can conclude that we have possibly integer coefficients or halves of integers. And then we have to right, they don't have to be positive, right? That's another thing. We don't, it doesn't have to be positive. I mean, the thing is, um, this is not known yet about non-negativity. And I'll say something about that at the end. In fact, we think that non-negativity is going to help us uh, on which it costs the most problem showing, giving a commentary proof of non-negativity. But it's not always true in general. Oh, for, for um, Okay, it's known for you know, spherically shellable process, which is like anything that's super nice, you know, and that you have non-negative coefficients for regular CD index. That's known. But to actually know what these um, coefficients mean, that's totally open. If you can find an interpretation, like a vector space interpretation, something like that, that would be a wonderful result. It would be very famous if you could find that, because that's something people are looking for. But the fact that we actually get um, nice, we can actually say, this, this works is, is fantastic because actually, um, I should mention this, so, well actually I'll mention this at the end because in a specific case of this, which I'm about to do, um, Bayer, uh, well it's too many B's in this talk, right? Bayer, Brenti, Valera, whoever else, I'm, Bjerner, um, so this is, uh, Valera and Brenti actually showed for um, the example I'm about to do when you look at Bruja Graeus, that we have this extended CD index. And they did this using quasi-symmetric functions and the peak algebra. And I didn't get to talk about the proof of this. We're actually getting into co-algebras and co-products. And so they're actually working in the dual picture, which is much harder. Whereas we're, we're somewhere where, for us, it's easier. So, um, so let me actually, again, talk about, skip the proof. Special case of all this stuff. Because that's, that's really the reason why I started to look at this. It was Bruja Okay, So, um, you know, actually, the example I'm going to look at, rather than defining everything very theoretically, is let's look at a specific example. So, we're going to look at um, the symmetric group on n elements. 
And if you recall that this is generated by um, involutions, we go switching one and two, switching two and three, et cetera. Okay, so we have that. And so what I want to do is, let me look at a specific example of this, which is going to be the symmetric group on three elements, just so we have something to get our hands on too. So I'm going to sort of define things while I sketch, so I hope that's okay. If I had flashy PowerPoint, I would have all these slides, and you wouldn't understand anything, so that's the point. Okay, one, two, three. Oh, I don't have enough space. i got to move over. So on the bottom, we're going to have the identity element, so we're writing everything in one line notation. is I want to start applying group elements to go up. So for example, um, covering 1, 2, 3 is going to be 1, 3, 2. And so what did I do here? I swapped the second and the third element. So I want to keep track of these things. So I, I want to use something that's called reflection ordering. And this always exists for Cogsitter groups in general. So, um, so this is swapping, swap, swapping one and two. This is going to be swapping one and three. This is going to be swapping the second and third position. And I'm going to use labels one for this one, two for this one, and three for this one. So for example here, one, two, three, I'm swapping the second and third position. So I'm going to label this edge by three. Um, and I can also swap the first and second, two and three. First and second is labeled by one. What else I can do? Swap first and second here, get three, one, two. So first and second. Here I can swap uh, second and third position. Two, three, one. So second and third position is labeled three. And then I can swap, here I can swap the second and third position to get three, two, one. And then here I can swap the first and the second position to get three, two, one. So right now, this is called weak Bruja order. And if you look at this, um, the grading that's going on here is that each of these permutations at this level can be written as none, no action on the identity permutation. Here, each of these is a product of one of the generators. You always take this minimal number of generators that gets it. Each of these is two, and this is the longest element, three. So you have a very natural length. So this is weak Bruja. Strong Bruja is um, we, we can conjugate um, 1, 2, and 2, 3. So we actually have 1, 3. We're allowed swapping 1 and 3. So I can, if I swap the first and the third position, I get 2, 3, 1. So this is labeled by 2. And then if I can swap here, um, first and third position, I get 3, 1, 2. So that's labeled by 2. So this is strong Bruchat order. So this is known as the Bruchat graph. Sorry, Bruchat posa. So this is strong Bruja order. Sometimes people say Bruja order, but I like to distinguish between weak and strong. To be clear about what you're looking at. Okay, now I'm going to allow something really different, which is we're going to allow shortcuts. <coughs> so I can go, you know, right now a nice graded posa. If you think of this as a posa or as a directed graph, I have a shortcut, which goes from one, two, three to three, two, one. And how do I get that? I'm swapping the first and the third position. So that's a two. And you know, no longer does this satisfy the grading, you know, but this is actually called the Bruja graph. And this is, we allow shortcuts. And let's write down the maximal chains in this. Let's look at this. So if we look again at encoding the maximum chains and their descent sets. So here, maximum chains, 3, 1, 3. Here we have 3, 2, 1. What else we have? 1, 2, 3. Hope I didn't make mistakes. 1, 3, 1. Then I have the shortcut, 2. 
if I look at their descents, three goes down to one, 